crowd here. Well, thank you so much for coming today to the Glass Craft Expo. I know it's only been a couple of months since we had one before. Or is that a couple of years? <laughs> a couple of years, actually. Isn't that wild? We actually missed. So we, we were here in, what was it, 1990? No, 2019, right? That we missed 2020, 2021. Two whole years. This is, wow. Unbelievable. Well, we are back. And we're back with a bang, or a whimper, or a little bit of each. So I'm glad that all of you have stayed with the art of glass. Working with glass as an art form is a passion of mine, and I suspect that since you guys are all here at this great show, it's probably a passion of yours as well. And there are so many ways that you can use glass as an art form. And all of these folks out here that are displaying the uh, various products that are available in this industry um, gives you that uh, really great experience to see how many different ways you can utilize this product to create art. And that's really what we're all here to do, is to create something fun, be creative, make something really spectacular that um, we can either sell to people who want to buy things or that we can just look at and, and say, wow, I made that and be happy about that too. Um, what I'm here to show you today is um, a couple of different things. Um, this whole process that I'm going to show you today is all about fusing. So if you are a stained glass artist, we also have uh, some things that we do with stained glass too, and that's been my career. I started, just to give you a little background to know who I am, I started my career in 1977. I was 24 years old, and I started my own business as a stained glass studio. And we were uh, creating stained glass windows and lampshades, church windows, and all that sort of thing in our studio, in our, uh, our workshop studio, and we were teaching uh, how to do it as a hobby as well. Um, it very quickly evolved from teaching it as a hobby to creating books for the art glass industry. Um, in 1983, I published my first book in uh, stained glass. And uh, three years later, I published a book called Introduction to Stained Glass, which is a very well, good-selling book. I call it an industry bestseller. We've sold over 600,000 copies of that book since 1985 when I first published it. Since then, we put out another whole bunch of books until we ended up with 50 different titles that we've got. Some of them are, quite a few of them now, are in Fusing. We have one called Joy of Fusing. If you haven't seen that book, please come to our booth. Joy of Fusing is a fabulous book. It teaches you everything you need to know about fusing from the very beginning, from safety, and gives you, I think it's 27 projects from very simple ones to more complicated ones. But more importantly, it teaches you the how to think about fusing, how to devise and create a uh, successful schedule. Um, what does annealing mean? All of these kinds of things, which many of you probably have heard. Um, some of you already know what they are, but many of you probably don't. That book will walk you through all of those kinds of things. So, without any further ado on my ads, here we are now in 2020, and old Randy is still doing this business because it's a wonderful thing to do. 
What we're doing now is a couple of new things. Um, we brought out this product called Glass Tattoo. Um, I think it's been seven or eight years now since we've been uh, showing this product. And what it allows you to do, it's really quite a versatile product. This is one example of something that I made with the Glass Tattoo product. This is a, uh, uh, the uh, pieces here, the fish are the Glass Tattoo part. The rest of the piece is actually just glass that you purchase. Of course, this is Bullseye Stringer. Um, glass that's on the base, and then the glass tattoo fish are on top. I'm going to show you how we did that in a minute. Here's another thing that we can do with glass tattoo. So this is using, we have, I think we now have around 100 different stencil designs. So the stencils look like this. Oh, uh, no, I have them here. I'm getting a little feedback here. All right, stencils look like this, kind of hard to see, but that's what it looks like. That's a hummingbird stencil, if you can't quite make out what it looks like. I don't know whether it's putting it in front of a piece of glass to to see it better, maybe. That's what it looks like. There you go, oh, go the other way. There he is, hummingbird. So a hummingbird stencil. Um, when you use these kinds of stencils, which have multiple pieces in them, you put them directly on the piece of glass, and then you color it with, the, I'm gonna show you how we do that, but we put the glass tattoo colors in there. So this has all been colored in one shot. So you use all those different colors in there. You can mix the colors together. Notice how we have the orange and the yellow and the reds all mixed together in one. So it's a custom created piece. And the greens are mixed together. Yep. Is this before fusing? No, this is before you fuse. This is just a raw piece of glass. So I start with a raw piece of glass. That's about that size. This is eight, it's, uh, six by nine, this particular piece. So a raw piece of glass where the edges are still sharp. You put the, you put the um, stencil of your design on top of that raw piece of glass. Then you use the, and I'll show you how we're going to do that in a second. Then you put the um, glass tattoo uh, goo colors on. Um, and then you pick the stencil up and you'll see how that, that's why I call it magic. You'll see that in a minute. Um, but I just want to show you all the different ways that you can use the glass tattoo goo. So the one way is with, with these stencils. Another way is this. We call this a smear. So all that I've done here is I took my uh, colors. So I used red here. So I just squirted some red on. And then I used my palette knife, like this. And I just smeared it around. So one of the things that you probably, if you don't already know this, many of you already do, but you can't mix, sometimes you can't mix two different, two colors together because they will create what's called reaction. Now, in a very broad speaking, hot colors do not mix with cold colors. So blue doesn't like to mix with red. Orange doesn't like to mix with green. Those kinds of things. Cool colors do not mix with hot colors. Um, there, there's a whole chemical reason behind that whole thing. And there are some colors that are cool colors, like whites. There are certain whites that you can get that will react. So you have to be very careful with the glasses that you're buying. But one of the things you have to be aware of is that even though we are using powdered glass in this process, they still will not play happy together. But you can use that to your advantage sometimes. Whereas you can have, you can see here, I've got blue touching red. I don't have it mixing. I have red and yellow and orange is mixing in here. So you can mix colors if they are on that, if they are mixable, they're not gonna have a reaction. Uh, you can mix them. But I, what I like to do is bring the blue right up to the edge of the red, and then you're gonna get a nice line. It's gonna be a reactive line that happens. And that happens really nicely a lot of times when you use these kinds of things, when you use the little, the little wafers. But let me show you how this works. I know you're all saying, yeah, that's all well good, Randy, but let me see how does it actually work. Well, first thing we have to do is we have to mix up our colors. So this is the colors in the squeeze tubes. Squeeze bottles are like this, squeeze bottles. They're very soft squeeze bottles, so it's really easy to squeeze the colors out. Start with a packet of glass tattoo goo. The glass tattoo goo is a uh, food grade product. You mix this with, so this, you put this uh, uh, one, where's my cup? So one cup of water, one cup of regular old water, one tablespoon of regular old household bleach. You put the bleach in because that's the next question people say to me, well, how long can you keep that stuff in your, uh, on your shelf? And the answer is if you put the bleach in it, you can have it there for months. It will be just fine for months because the bleach kills the mold. If you don't put the bleach in it, it's gonna go moldy on you within about two weeks. So you wanna put the bleach in. So the way we do it is we start with a cup 
uh, a one cup container, put in one tablespoon of bleach in there, fill the rest of it with water, dump it into one of these kinds of bowls, sprinkle one packet on top, mix it up, give it about three hours, it coagulates and turns into goo. So then, once you have the goo, you mix the goo together with powdered glass. So it doesn't matter what powdered glass you want to use, the only thing that matters is if you're using 96 as your base glass, you must use 96 powders, or 90 and 90. So really, that's the main thing. Other than that, you can use any uh, of the powders that you want. It even works with float powders and float glass. Because what's happening here is the glass tattoo goo, that's this stuff, all it is is a carrier, because it burns off when you fire the glass. But the beautiful thing is, I'm going to make one right now. Let's do, let's do this one. Can you see that there? Yeah, we're going to do the uh, fleur de lis. Let's do the fleur de lis. I, want, I know your diet is always worse. It's pretty cool. I have a little spot here so I can do it for you. Under. Oh, we turn it the other way. There, we're going to have it straight up, the right way. Okay, there we go. I'm going to get the center here for you. My camera works not that great. There we go. Okay, so now we have our goo colors are mixed. So you might say, how do you get the goo color into the bottle? And the answer is, yep. Okay, so that's right. So now that we have our goo mixed up, it is one to one. So if you, what this is, um, to fill one of these bottles, it's one third cup, a one third cup of goo, and a one third cup of powder. Put it in a bowl, or what I like to do is put it into a Ziploc baggie, and then just swish it around inside that Ziploc baggie until it's all nice and uh, uh, mixed up. Cut the corner off the baggie, and then just squeeze that whole thing right in there. Um, the other way you can do it is, if you're mixing up a lot of different colors, if you want to do it uh, more quickly, you can use, um, a cake mixer, an electric cake mixer in a bowl and then you just take take it out of there with a spatula and put it in one of those throwaway um, funnels that you get for cake decorating. Cut the bottom off the funnel, squish it in there. It goes in really fast. I made these up this morning between getting up this morning and going down for breakfast. So it does not take long to do. By the way, I did not put the bleach in this because they won't let me travel with bleach. I don't know why. Anyway, let's go ahead and make a fleur de lis, shall we? So, I don't know, I'm just going to make a really colorful one. Let's start with red. So, what I do is I take, the, I've got the red cap on the bottom of it. It's important to keep that red cap on because if you don't, just like Elmer's glue, it's going to harden right in the tip. It's not going to hurt anything because you're just going to take that uh, tip. If it does harden in there, let's say you haven't used your colors in a month, it's going to be hard for about the first quarter of an inch. You just take it off, poke it out with a, with a little uh, toothpick, Clean the tip only, stick it back on, and ready to go. But since I just made this up this morning, it should work perfectly. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my... Step away. Step away from the mic. All right, here we go. Why is it doing that? Nothing I'm having to do with. I know. But yeah. Where's my tech tag? Doesn't like me. It doesn't like me leaning over for some reason. Let me see if I can do it different here. I don't, this is not, not good for that way, happening like that. Randy, could you move those bottles back just a little bit? Please yeah, sure. and then, I, then I could get a really sharp view of that. Thank you. Awesome. All right, let's put this on this way and see if that stops it. Oh, yeah, you can hear me now. <laughs> I'll grab a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> okay, here we go. Doesn't work. Shoot, let's go. Yeah, it doesn't like, it doesn't like, I'm going to try to do it anyway. All right, I'm just going to do it with, with uh, a little bit of happening here. So let me get this done. Yeah. So we're just going to squeeze it out of here. And what I'm going to do is, shoot, there we go, put it in like that. So it doesn't matter. So you, can, you don't have to be really fancy with it. I'm just going to put it in a few of these spots. I have to stand away from it here. Uh, oh, you know what? Let's put a different color. So I'm going to start with that. Where is my mixer? There it is. 
All right, so now I got it on there. I'm going to just hold on to the stencil very gently, and I'm just going to move it around, try to get it. Oh, that is just maddening. Where's my tech? I need a tech guy here. This is not good. Okay, so this stencil is an eighth of an inch thick. And that's not an accident. The reason it's an eighth of an inch thick is because, as we just learned a little while ago, this is a mixture of 50-50. Uh, so in other words, 50% of this mixture is the goo. And remember, the goo is going to burn off when we fire it. So you're going to be left with a 1 16th thickness of color. And that's important because the 1 16th inch of color is going to give you those nice, deep, rich colors that you see when you look at this. It gives you those deep, rich colors. That's only a 16th of an inch of color. If, it was, if you were trying to use one of the traditional stencils, which is only a 30 second of an inch thick, when you do this, you're going to be up to the 16th of an inch of color, and it's going to be washy. It's not going to look very nice, deep, rich color. So we started out with just, all I'm doing is just smoothing it off like that. All right, so then we'll start with another. We're going to put a yellow one. Now, one of the things I want to show you, you notice that I got a little, can you see that little bit of blue right in there? So I'm just going to try to get that blue out of there, because that's going to react to my uh, piece. So you can pull it out of there. And a little bit in there isn't going to really hurt that much. Because the yellow's going to overpower it. Put, so we get a, so we can keep some symmetry here. We'll do it the same on the other side. Now I didn't bring any paper towels up here. It would have been a good idea. So all I'm doing now is I'm pushing it around so that I make sure that I'm filling that cavity. And then I'm just going to grab that yellow back because I don't want to waste it. Put it right back in my jar. I'll do the same on the other side. Now normally when I do this, I have one of those cake decorated Lazy Susans. Oh, thank you so much. So you know what a cake decorated Lazy Susan is, right? So the nice thing is you put your piece of glass on that cake decorated Lazy Susan and I don't have to be reaching over all the time. I can just have it in front of me when I want to do the other side, just spin it around and do the other side so it's close to me. So it's much easier to work on something like that. All right, so I'm going to just wipe that. This nice young lady brought me a paper towel up here. I just wipe the excess off of my knife so that I don't mix the colors together when I do the next one. So let's see, what's, now I'm going to try this red here. I don't know why the red is sticking in there. There it is, okay. So now I'm just going to pick that red up right there. I'm going to put it right in these little spots here. I didn't, the only reason I did that was because I didn't want it to come smashing out of there so quickly. So now I know it works. I'm going to put it in there like this. Put there, put there, put there. Uh, there we go. So now, let's just go ahead and stuff. Wait a minute, my mother's calling me. <laughs> Hang it up on it. All right, so I'm making, trying to make sure I don't mix that, get any of that red on my blue. And all I have to do is make it smooth. That's it. I don't have to, you know, get all that, you don't have to clean all of that off. Like this part that you're seeing right in here, you don't have to clean all that off. All I've done is just make it smooth. Because what I'm gonna do now is do the lift. So all I do is I put my thumbs, you can see that, and I put the, my two thumbs are gonna become the hinge. So they're going to touch both the glass and the edge of the stencil. The other two th fingers on the other end are going to just pick the stencil up this way, side, just like this. And there we have it. So see what's left on there? If I was doing this in my studio, I drop this in. I have a, a tub of water. Just throw that in the water. Use a brush like this, and you just paint it right off. It comes off instantly. But look at this. doesn't go anywhere because the goo is thick enough that it'll hold it just like that. Now, I could take this and put it in the kiln right now if I wanted to, ready to go. If I were put it in the kiln right now, however, I'd want to be careful because I know you've all heard this, never put anything wet in a kiln because putting things wet in a kiln will 
if you just put it in the kiln and heat it up like you would normally heat up any other fusing, that wet is going to react to the glass and it may crack it and you get a thermal shock. So if I'm going to put this in wet, I'm going to put it in my kiln and I'm going to add a step to the very front of my process. I'm going to add a drying step. So when, where is the boiling point of water? Where's my, where's my physicist? 212 degrees. Like, boiling point is 212 degrees. You got it. There you go. Gives him an extra star for the teacher. <laughs> 212 is the boiling point. So water will evaporate at a much lower temperature than that. You don't want to get it to 220 because then you'll have it. The water will start boiling in here. What's that going to do? It's going to cause little bubbles and little pock marks, little, little volcanoes that come out. So you want to dry it. So that means I take it up. What I do is I take it to 165 degrees and I hold it there for about 45 minutes. So I add one step to the beginning, 165 degrees, 45 minutes. That will dry all the water out of there. From that point on, standard old fusing. Whatever you like to fuse at. If you'd like to take it up to a just a second, are we ready with you? If you'd like to take it up to just a tack fuse, which is around 1,250 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the kiln, um, you can do that, and it'll just be very, very high. If you want it to, with my favorite temp uh, temperature is what I call contour, which is about 1380, and you can come up and check this later, but it gives you some texture. So if you, you can't really see it, I don't think the camera will really let me see it, but a little bit. It's, it sticks up off the glass. In other words, this is, there's texture to this. I like the texture because to me it makes it feel, you know, it gets you some dimension. Even if you're looking at it from a distance, there's a little bit of shadow there. But what's cool about this thing is look at those edges, how sharp they are. And the neat thing is they stay sharp when you fire it. And the reason that happens is because I told you before that this glass tattoo product burns off in the kilns. And it does. But it doesn't start to burn off till it's around 1,000 degrees. Actually, it burns off right where glass starts to sinter. Sinter means starts to harden or uh, soften enough that it sticks. Sintering means that it will the, gla the glass powders, which of course are so small that they're going to be the very first thing that starts to melt, they start to stick to your glass at the same time as the uh, glass tattoo 2 product burns off. So it's right around 1,050 to 1,200 degrees. Not quite 12, 1,050 to 1,075 in that basic area is where the sintering happens. And when I say sintering, the reason that's important is because the powder glass starts to stick to itself. If you just try to do this without any kind of, um, uh, of uh, goo, just put the powder in there and pick it up, it's just going to all foof and into each other. You could, you could use a little bit of water in there. It's still going to, the water is too runny, it's going to run in there. So one of the other things that you've probably heard of is um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Two, no, freeze and fire. So freeze and fire uses a mold that you put the powder with water and you freeze it and then you put it in the kiln. And that works pretty good. But as we know, the problem is, is that water burns off at 212 degrees or evaporates at 212 degrees. So by the time it gets up to that, say 500 degrees, there's absolutely no moisture left. And so that powder is just sitting there until it gets up to center temperature of 1100 degrees. That's why uh, fuse freeze and fuse, you don't get those really nice, crisp, sharp edges like you do with the glass tattoo system. So I've shown you how to do it this way, but I wanted to show you how did I do this, because this is a really neat thing to do. And the way I did this is by creating what we call wafers. So a wafer, oh my god, wafer designs, here's some wafer designs here. So this is a wafer stencil right here that makes that sharp, oh, the other one. makes that sharp, that sharp is this dude right here. So, what I did was, I take the stencil, close the sharp stencil, so let me just move this out of the way, because we don't, when we're gonna make a wafer, we don't use uh, the, um, uh, the glass, we just use a piece of plastic. Now, what I usually do is I will put a piece of glass inside this plastic, maybe a piece of white glass that's the right size, so that it's, it gives it a little bit of rigidity, and it also lets me see it a little better. I don't have a piece of white glass. I mean, you know what? Maybe we'll try this. Even though it's got a gecko on the back side of it, at least it'll let me see it a little better. All right, so I'm going to make this chart. So I'm just going to put it just like that. Kind of hard to see. Ah, you'll see it when it starts to color it up. So let's go ahead and make this a blue chart. He's going to be upset with me because I made him blue, I'm sure of it. 
So I'm just going to put some blue in here, like this. And blue like that. Now, bring my knife off. And I'm just going to take it this way. So what I'm doing now is I'm brushing it away from the center of the shark. Just to make it flat. I just, I just don't like to waste anything, so I always scoop my uh, colors up and put them back into the jar. Another way that I do this sometimes is I'll just have a spare piece of glass hanging around beside me so that I can just swipe it off on that piece of glass. So if it's only one color, I can put that back into the jar. But sometimes when the colors are being mixed together, you mix and say an orange, a red, and a yellow together to get your, a nice uh, effect. You've got three different colors in there. You can't put that back into one color jar, but you can actually put it into a multicolored jar and you end up with a multicolored color. That's a, that's a uh, frugal I am. So now I'm going to get that first one done like that. Clean this off. Now, I told you before, you're not supposed to mix you know, hot colors and cool colors, but I'm not going to mix these, but I'm going to allow them to touch one another. So now, I'm going to be very careful when I do this next swipe in here that I let it touch the blue, but I'm not going to touch the blue with my knife. Because if I touch the blue with my knife, I'm going to end up smearing those two things together. I don't want that because even if a little bit of that blue comes onto the surface of the yellow, you're going to end up with brown, wherever that happens. So I just want the two of them to, to be touching, but not mixed. So I'm just trying to get it so that it's just kind of patting it around there to get it so that it's actually filling that gap, but not mixing together. Like that. All right, so we need some black because shark fins always have black. So we're going to put some black on the tips here. And Scoot those off a little bit. Like that. And now, because he's a shark, a scary shark, we've got to give him one of the one of these dead eyes. Or just like that. Alright, now, same thing as we did before. We're just simply going to use my thumbs as hinges and lift it off. Now you have to lift this off a lot more slowly because it's also picking up the plastic of the, of the plastic bag. A lot of times what I'll use instead of a plastic bag, which just happened to be what I have here at the show, um, is a, some, a thicker plastic. When you buy products from Uncle Jeff on uh, Amazon, it comes with plastic, thicker plastics a lot of times. Save those th thicker plastics, they're perfect for doing this. Regardless, this still works this way. Now, when I pick that off there, I lost my little tip on there, but that's okay. I can go in here, and I can play around with this thing and do anything I want to at this point. Add a little bit of extra black in that, because I want it to be a black tip on that shark skin. Now, we have to pick this up here. So, again, there, there's my Mr. Shark. All right, now, the cool thing about this is that I just designed this whole guy in one time. I'm going to let this dry overnight. Once it dries overnight, it's not going to stick to the plastic. It will stick to glass, but it will not stick to plastic. You just, it'll just pop right off this plastic and it'll be one piece. Here's one that I did and then broke on the way. But anyway, this is, as you can see, is a, used to be, uh, there it is, a butterfly. See my butterfly? Is he up there? Yeah. So this is a butterfly. And these things are, you can break them, as you can see. But they're actually very strong. It'd be surprising how strong these things are. So what I do when I created this was I created, we have uh, one of our um, uh, uh, tattoo uh, stencils has five fish on it. So these ones here, these five are here. So these are the bigger dudes. There's four big ones. And they're, where is he right now? I just had him. It's a side here. So this size right here, that one, is actually that one right there. See? 
So I just make up a whole bunch of these. I just sat down one day and for about two hours I just made up a whole bunch of fish. Um, the one that comes with five fish in a single stencil, you can make it, I, what I do when I do that kind of thing is I make them all the same basic uh, 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 color schemes. So I'll maybe say a bunch of, in this case, I have green, a green bottom part and a little blue at the top and then a stripe in it. In this case you can see that I've done a lot of yellow. So there's orange in the middle, yellows on the fins, red in the center, and that's all being smeared together. And then I put on top of that spaghetti strings as my design. And the little eyeball here is just a black, or you can use any color that you want, but it's just a little black eyeballs. See, there's the spaghetti stringers right there coming this way. And it's just, I just did a blue ring all the way around. Yes? Yep. See, the question was, you put stringers on while it's wet. And the answer is yes. Everything, the whole design is created in one shot. Yes. So the answer, the question there is, what if you don't want to do that first step in the kiln to add an extra step at the front to do a drying? You just leave it till tomorrow. That's all you do. So you make your design and then leave it till tomorrow. Yes, I forgot to come back to your question. Sorry. Yeah. Is the, the colors food safe, you mean? So yes, actually, um, this stuff is very food safe. In fact, let me just do another demonstration for you. That's how food safe it is. In fact, every one of you have eaten this stuff already. Have you ever had creamy salad dressing? That's how they make salad dressing creamy. Hmm. But um, there are a bunch of different kinds of this thickening agent that you can get for foodstuffs. And I had to deal, I, I actually ended up playing around with about 35 of them until I found the one that would stay until a thousand degrees before it burnt off. Very many of them burn off in five, 600 degrees. And then that's a point when then the, uh, it, the, the powder relaxes and it didn't get as sharp, clean edges. And I was really looking for these sharp, I wanted the sharp, clean edges on there. Um, that's important for me because I want it to look like this. I mean, when you look at this thing, this is pretty remarkable. Oops, the other one. Remarkable when you think of it. That's all done in one shot. That entire design is done in one shot. So I used, as you can see, yellow, orange, and then red in each one of those little cavities. So each cavity is a part of the cavity of the stencil. And in here I used three different greens. So a very pale green, a darker green, and then there's a mid green in there as well. So that whole thing was done. But look at the borders. So the border, that's just a spaghetti stringer with a dab of red at the end to hold the spaghetti stringers in place until I fired it. Hmm. So that whole thing was done in one shot. Um, if you teach classes at all, this is one of the most amazing things to teach in class because people can do stuff that blows their mind the very first night. The other cool thing about it is if you teach a class somewhere that's remote from your studio, like a school classroom or at a uh, the community center room, that type of thing, you don't have a kill there, and you have to take all the stuff that everybody makes, and you've got to take it home in your car, and hope the heck it doesn't move all over the place before you get it into the kiln. The cool thing about this product is, you can take this stuff, as, you, as I just showed you earlier, and you can take that and take it out to your car, and put it into your car, and it's going to get home just like that, just exactly the way that the person made it, every time. Even if they add little spaghetti stringers and all kinds of other designs around it, as long as they glue them down with a dab, and I have right here, this is just clear, this is with the same stuff. This is the glass tattoo without coloring. That becomes glue now. So that's what I use to glue down things if I don't want. If I wanted to do these spaghetti stringers here and I didn't want to have a dab of, on the end of it, I just could use a, a, a clear and hold it down there. Or you could use black on the, on the corners, which would go with the black border in this case. Um, a couple of other things that's kind of neat. So we made all of these little guys. Look at these are little, these are little, uh, 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 what do you call them? The things that you hang on you. There we go, the name of it is brochette, bro, bro, something. Anyway, glued a little uh, hook on the back of it. That's one of my fish that I just simply stuck on a piece of clear, fired it. Now you got these cute little designs. A whole bunch of them here. You can come and see these later if you like. But that's what they look like. There's one on a, on a circuit. What's going on with my mic? Mr. Mike is not happy with me today. Yeah, okay. That won't go over my ears. It's ridiculous. All right. 
we got to get that tech guy up here. Okay, so uh, a couple of other things I want to show you before my time is up. And how much I Oh, I guess lots of time. All right. Um, so how did I make this plate? It's really quite simple. <clears throat> we made it on my Bionistry mold. This is my Bionistry mold. Um, this is a mold that we uh, design and sell. Um, it's got a foot in the back of it. So the first thing I have to do is create that foot. I have to cast that foot. And I cast it right inside this mold. So I just simply take shards of glass, and a shard of glass is anything that's a quarter of an inch to a half an inch, even three quarters of an inch. I just use my mosaic breakers and just break these pieces of glass up into big, fairly large shards. Those shards go into this cavity right in here. I put it in the kiln first, put the shards in that cavity, fire it to 1460. Let it sit for a half an hour, all thing casts down into a nice disc of glass that's all cast. Then I create my design, my flat design. So my flat design in this case, I started out with a piece of white, opal white, which was 12 inches circle. You can see that there's a little bit of a white lip around the outside edge here, an eighth of an inch white lip. The reason there's an eighth of an inch white lip is because I cut my colored piece in the center, I cut it a quarter of an inch smaller. So 12 inch outside diameter for my white, 11 and 3 quarter inch diameter for my uh, design color. And that means I'm going to be left with an eighth of an inch all the way around the outer edge, which gives me what is called in the glass blown business a lip wrap. Now, had I done it with a more contrasting color, you would see that's even more, uh, more apparent. But that's how you achieve a lip wrap. One of the things that I try to do, I've been doing glass blowing for years, and glass blowing is hard. I'm not very good at it. But I would, I'm trying to always make things in my kiln that can look as much like glass blowing as possible. That's why I put these cookie foots on the bottom of my mold, create these molds to put a cookie foot. Because in the glass blowing business, we put cookie foots on everything. The cookie foot, all you do is you take a gathered glass out of, the, out of the furnace, drop it on the marver table. Once it turns into a, like a hockey puck sized thing, then you take your bubble, which is on the end of your pipe, and you drop it on the end, and then you pick it up, and now the cookie's stuck onto the bottom of the bubble. Then you put your punky on the bottom of that cookie that you just made, knock off the pipe, and open up the hole in the top that creates a bowl. That's good. How's that for a 30 second explanation of how glass blowing works? But I always wanted to be able to put a cookie foot on my, on my pieces because to me, when you put a piece like this that's just plain old flat on the table, it just looks like a plain old flat dish that you can get. But when you put it on the table like this, I think you will agree, then now it looks like something pretty cool because it's actually raised off the table. <clears throat> so, back to how I did this. So I cut that 11 and 3 quarter inch piece, I put that on top. Then, after I had all of my um, fish bait, my, my two sharks, and all of my different fish, I just started laying them out. And by the way, I have this whole video on how you make this on my website. Um, I think this whole thing from scratch, but I, the first thing I did was I put my two sharks in the middle. And the way you do that is I just take um, my um, wafer after it's dry, put a little dab of that um, goo in the middle of it that's not any color on it, and then just drop it in there. It sticks, it'll stick. Because one drop of that goo on the bottom is all you need to hold that wafer in place. So I put my two sharks down first. And then I decided that this was going to be called the shark bait plate. So the sharks, and these are as bait. So, First thing I tried was, I, well, I'll just put the little fish all randomly all over the place. I tried that and looked awful. So then I started laying them in and I thought, well, I'll put, I'll put a couple of little dudes in here that looks like the shark is, is chasing a fish. And I didn't really look at that great either. So I thought, well, you know what? What if I just put them all in a ring all the way so they're swimming around a ring of the shark? And I thought, well, that looks pretty nice. So the nice thing with this process is that because you have all these little wafers, you can play around with the design. You're not stuck with it. The, you could do the same thing even with this. You could create a, uh, a multi-piece uh, stencil. Like I said, we have 100, almost 100 designs. Here's a big fish that we have. You could put a big fish in the middle of a bigger piece of glass and then put some of the little dudes around outside of it. So you can play around with it. It gives you the ability, and again, back to classes. <clears throat> if you make a whole bunch of these fish, or we have lots of different, we have wine glasses and, and wine bottle, um, is that, I don't know, probably 30 different um, wafer that we, uh, designs we have. <coughs> Excuse me. One explanation. 
What's the difference between a wafer design stencil and a regular design stencil? And that is that a wafer is simply one cavity. It has to be a single cavity to make a wafer. Because obviously, if you tried to make a wafer out of, the, out of uh, the one we made earlier, once that dries in the plastic, each one of those pieces is going to be its own individual wafer. So now you've got to put the puzzle back together again. So it would work, but it's going to be more difficult to do because it's, you, know, you have to rebuild it. Wafers are a single cavity, and then you use that single cavity as your design start point, and then you build your design around that single cavity. Here's a dragonfly, same thing. <clears throat> so I put one dab of uh, the regular old uh, goo under there to hold them all in place. Uh, put that in my kiln and fired it. In this case, I fired it to 1380 Fahrenheit. That's my favorite temperature because that's the contour temperature. It takes it down so that it is, um, so you have a little bit of texture. You can come up and run your finger off this, you feel that there's texture there. <clears throat> you can even feel that some of the goo is still raised around the outside edges on some of those pieces. Which for me, you can see that, you can see it on that orange right there. You can probably see it, that the outer edge, all the way around the outside edge, has a nice raised quality to it. So rather than feel like that's a bad thing, I like that. But if you don't like that, all you have to do is take it up to 1425 and the whole thing will go completely flat. So then you'll have totally flat. Now, the hotter you take it, the more bleed you get on the color. So the edges aren't quite as sharp the hotter you take it. Because, of course, all of the glass is now starting to melt together. And then you put the design disc on the top of it and then you slump them. The top disc slumps and touches down on that foot and sticks at the same time. So it's one slump and it sticks to your foot. The way that it sticks to the foot, however, is it creates a little cavity all the way around the other edge of that foot, and all you have to do is wrap a wire inside that cavity and twist it at the top, and now you can hang this on the wall, like a nice uh, art piece, and then when friends come over, you take it off the wall and you've served salad in it. The beauty on this particular mold is that not only does it make a beautiful bowl on this side, but you flip it over and it makes a platter on this side, a completely flat platter. So you come to the studio or over to the um, booth here and you'll see the, fl the platter completely flat with a foot on the bottom of it, a cake type platter. Um, our newest mold is this one here. And even though I don't have had anything that I built on it to this point because I've only this mold is so new that nobody nobody even knows me. I had to tell the run around and tell my wholesalers that we had a new mold here so they didn't get mad at me when they didn't tell them ahead. But we literally uh, just brought these to the show. It's the first time it's been seen. What does this do? It creates this. So again, as I said before, I'm always trying to make things that look like glass blowing. So this has a foot on the bottom of it too, a cookie foot. Works exactly the same way, except <clears throat> in the case of the Binosphere, you literally make the foot cast it right in the mold itself. In this one, we have a foot mold so that you can make a bunch of mold, a, a bunch of feet, which are cast discs basically, ahead of time. And then once you have that disc, you just simply drop it in the center of that mold Put your design disc on the top of these five pieces here and when it slumps in it slumps touches the foot and you create this now it's also got that little lip around the outside edge and you can wrap a wire around it but what this does is it looks like a, a, it's a blown glass technique that we used to do a lot in the glass shop because what you do and if you've seen any chihuly's bowls and things this is how chihuly does it too so i've already explained to you how you put the cookie down and you put the punty on the bottom of the cookie then you will knock the pipe off the top, it's a little hole in there, and then you put it in the glory hole until it gets really hot, and then you start spinning it. And it just, the plate goes completely flat. And then, while it's still hot, you hold it like this. In other words, I'm holding the punties on the end, you hold it down, and then nature, gravity, just starts pulling it down to these little things like that. So you end up then with a, uh, a really cool, random style flutter edge. Of course, we can't do random in here. They're all going to look the same because it's in a hard mold. But you get the same basic effect with the cookie foot all in one shot. Okay, mm -hmm. you say, um, yeah, this one. Has to be fired first. So the question is, are you making the foot at the same time as you're doing the fire as you're doing the slumping? And the answer is no. You have to make the foot ahead of time. Why is that? And the answer is because this foot on the bottom is actually cast. So casting glass is a temperature of 1,460 degrees. You have to take it up to the point where the glass is literally molten so that it actually comes back together as one single piece of glass. 
whereas slumping temperature is only about 1250. So if you were to put the pieces of glass, the little shards of glass in the bottom of this thing, and then put this thing on top and then slump it, those shards will be sticking together, but they're still going to look like shards that are sticking together. They're not going to look like a real foot. So it is a three-step process to make one of these. First step is to cast the foot. Second step is to make your flat design disc. And then the third step is to put a, the cast foot into the cavity, put the design on the top of it, and then let it slump down. It touches the foot inside. Now your foot sticks to it, so that's a three-step process. Make the cast foot, make your design disc, and then do your slumping. Are you doing the shards of glass now in that? Yes. Okay. And in fact, here's an interesting little process. So when you create a 12-inch diameter uh, uh, outside, and by the way, this is a single layer of glass, that white, that clear rather, it's just one layer. Now, we do have a ring around the outside of this one that we made uh, to, to give that uh, the edge uh, a little bit extra, but you don't have to do that. You don't have, it doesn't have to be double layered. A lot of people think that all fusing has to be two layers thick. Not true. I do a lot of single layer thick stuff, lots and lots of single. In fact, I would say 80% of my things that I do are single layer. And the reason for that is, goes back to my glass blowing days. If you bought a bowl from a, a glass blower or a vase from a glass blower and it was a quarter of an inch thick, what would you think? That person doesn't know how to blow glass. Because a quarter of an inch thick vase or a quarter of an inch thick bowl never comes out of a blowing shop. It always goes in the trash because it's too thick. So glass doesn't have to be a quarter of an inch thick. It wants to be, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. The depth of what? No, no, it doesn't make any difference at all. So the question is, if you have a, a, a quarter inch thick piece or a one inch thin, thick piece, is that gonna change how you slump? And no, it's the same temperature, it's the same everything. The only difference is, is that a single layer of glass is gonna to wanna to shrink on you when you get it up to high temperatures. That's why Randy likes contour fuse temperature of 1380 because the shrinkage is very small at 1380. Once you take it above that temperature into full fuse temperature, then you're gonna get some serious shrinkage, especially on the edges. You're gonna get that little raised up edge on the edge. And if it's a shape like a square, it's gonna turn into what's called a dog bone shape because the, the center pieces are gonna shrink quicker than the corners are. Um, so if you're gonna do anything like that, make sure you don't go about contour fusing. Get to love it because it's your friend that makes it really good and you use half as much material because you're only doing one layer of thickness. But, um, as you can see, this is a very simple design. That is a, the other edge on that is a, a, what we call a split ring. So if you're not seeing how to cut a split ring, you cut, oh, that's what I was gonna tell you. Cutting a 12 inch diameter, because the question was, somebody asked, what's the shards in there? If you're gonna cut a 12 inch diameter disc, you always start with a 13 inch square, 13 square. You always start with a square to cut a circle, always, always, always. If you're gonna cut a six inch circle, you start with a seven inch square. 8 inch circle, 9 inch square, always so that you have an inch larger than the circle you want so that where the edges, corners meet those edges, is a half an inch left. If you get really good at it, you could you could maybe knock that down to 3 quarters of an inch so you have a 3 eighths of an inch in there, but that's going to run the risk of not getting a really clean corner or uh, edges. Why do I like that process? Why am I telling you that? One, number one, I want you to have success when you're cutting circles. Number two, when you start with a, in this case this was a clear back, 13 inch square, I cut that 12 inch diameter, I have four corners left. Guess what? That four corners is exactly the right amount of glass to make your foot. So, if you're making a, one of these like this, I could have used the, uh, the white, or I could have used the um, stringer glass to make my foot. So that might have been nice actually to use the stringer glass corners to make my foot in this case. Um, I didn't do it in this case because I had another purpose for those stringer pieces, but I could have used that. So you're not wasting stuff. You're using the corners that you would normally stack up in your uh, uh, drawers uh, until you get to the point where you have no more drawers. And now your choice is you either have to, you have to, have to throw stuff away from the drawers or buy more drawers. So uh, uh, I like to use as much as I can, always try and use my scraps as much as I possibly can. One last thing just been handed that he's, he's, he's got the hook out for me over there. He just gave me the hook, a five minute hook. Yes. How to make the split ring? Okay, well, the split ring, now that's a whole interesting ball game, but the way you do that is you start out by making a 12 inch diameter circle. 
and then you come in, in this case I think we came in three quarters of an inch, um, you make another score all the way around, all the way around. Now, you turn it upside down so that the score is down. You have to have something soft on your tabletop, like a piece of carpet, or you can use those shelf liner things, that kind of a spongy shelf liner. Put it upside down and then start pushing with your thumb all the way around on that score. Push, push, push till it runs all the way around, till it meets at the other end. And when it meets at the other end, you'll hear a little tip. You'll go tip, and the two pieces meet. Then check to make sure it's done all the way around. Turn it back over so that you're now the side that you scored is now back to the top again. And then you use your glass cutter. And you start your glass cutter an eighth of an inch away from the score and pull back. Turn it back over. Put down on that. And then you can just pull that ring right off. It stays as a complete ring. And you can do it down to a quarter of an inch when you get good at it. So there's two things you gotta be good at. One is you gotta score really, really accurately. Because if you have a little jump in your score, it's not gonna run as good. Second most important thing is make sure that run goes all the way around. So when you think you have it run all the way around, run around it, thumb around all the way around a second time. Because you want to make sure that that break has, that run has gone all the way around that entire ring. And then you make that final release score, and you'll be surprised. It's just going to pop right up here. Just pop. It's unbelievable. It's really a quite a neat. If I were selling glass cutters, I'd be doing that demonstration here right now. Because it's really spectacular to see. But I don't sell glass cutters. I sell tattoo goop. One last thing, two things I want to show you. The smear, I talked about it when we first started. How do I do the smear? The smear is done like this. So I just start with a color. Put it over here. Right. Start with a color, come on. See, I should have put it in my caddy. I have a, a bottle caddy. These are supposed to go back in the bottle caddy like that, which keeps the color in. I right, wouldn't do that. Anyway, I'm just going to put some colors on here, just like this. Now, when you look at this, you can see through it a little bit, right? It looks a little bit translucent. It's actually opal powders, but it looks translucent, and that's because I smeared it like this. See that smear? Whoop, I put it in there. There it is. That's it. Now, if I wanted to be really cool about it, I could then add some other color. I could put another, maybe a green or another lighter blue or a darker blue in here and smear that around a little bit. As long as the colors you're smearing together, match. In other words, that they are not going to react to one another. You can get a sphere and you can turn an entire piece of clear. This is a single layer piece of clear with colors on it. After I got all my colors smeared on it, I just took some of that black and I just started putting a little black design on it. Just ran it on top. That was it. No, after that, I didn't smear it. I just ran it on top and let it go. Um, and then finally, I want to show you this. This is a, is a bill. This is a glass tattoo build. All this is, here's what it looks like before it's fired. Here's what it looks like after it's fired. So this has just been center fired, means it takes it up to tack fuse only. So this is just a component that we're going to use. As you can see, it's a mountain with a snow cap mountain. So when we fire this one, we can then lay them on top of one another like that. So you can then build it using various components. We also have uh, uh, trees that we make. Same thing. So you just draw the trees on plastic again. You're drawing it on plastic. So then you do the drawing on the plastic, it creates a wafer. This is just a fancy wafer. That wasn't stencil wafer, this was a hand-drawn wafer. Time, it says that's it. All right, I have to go. They're pulling me off the table. If you want to know more about my stuff, come see me over the booth. I'm right over here.